previously on balls. Were a couple of problems that happened in the uh, yeah. the Iron Man of uh, 2013. And hopefully joining us on the line, it is Professor Tim Noakes. Uh, Tim, how are you there, sir? Very well, thank you, indeed. Excellent. Thanks very much for joining us uh, this afternoon on, on uh, Balls Visual Radio. Um, could, I suppose our concern uh, stems from uh, the, so, the, the unfortunate uh, fatalities from the Iron Man over this past weekend. Yeah, indeed. Obviously, it's very tragic. The, the problem for us as scientists and doctors to understand is why do these deaths most commonly occur in the swimming phase of the triathlon? Mm. which you would think is perhaps less stressful than the running or the cycling, and it occurs so early on in the race, before the guys have really warmed up and have become dehydrated or anything else like that. So it's, it's really a mystery, but the global experience is that it's the swimming leg, which is the really dangerous section of the triathlon. And, Avi, what if you... What have your uh, findings actually revealed? I mean, how far have you gone into this, and and how do you th- would you do, are you confident well, of, of of finding some kind of a solution or or getting an answer? Well, obviously, I'm not the guy who's doing all the research, but there have been reports out of the United States where they've collected information on what are the risks in the swim, in the triathlon. And it turns out it's far more risky, for example, than than running marathons. And we absolutely have no idea whatsoever why it should occur so frequently in the swim. And the, the only assumption is that these people have some latent abnormality in the heart and it causes an abnormal heart rhythm. And we don't know why that should happen under these specific conditions. Why is it exposure to the water that, that causes it? Now, any triathlete, and I've done a few myself, knows that when you get into the water, it's really taxing, particularly if you're not an experienced swimmer. And it seems to that is a particularly stressful event, that mm. you go from a low heart rate to a very high heart rate within seconds. And then you've got the problems of swimming in a mass of people, and there's all this churning, and you get kicked, and so on and so forth. And so it is probably the most stressful part of the, of the triathlon. But even then, I mean, these athletes train, and you wouldn't expect that they couldn't cope with this additional stress. So it's, it really is a mystery. And, and also, we don't expect always that you will find the cause at autopsy, so that people would think, oh, you're going to find clear evidence for a heart attack, and in many ca- or clear evidence for heart disease. But in many cases, there may be no evidence at all. So it is a real mystery, and... You know, the only way one would, would ever solve it is to, if you could measure the electrical activity in the heart before and after the catastrophe or as it happens. And that would then give you some indication of what we should be looking for. It, it is, I mean, incredibly worrying. Uh, 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 Professor, I mean, if, if somebody is, is physically fit, I mean, somebody has to have a, a certain element of fitness if you're going to do something like the, 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 the Iron Man. So, as you say, it, it's quite a, quite a mystery that all of a sudden these things would happen. Exactly, and, and the triathletes are probably the best trained of all athletes that we have in South Africa. You know, they are the really hard trainers, and when you go and look at them, you won't see a more athletic group of athletes, or very seldom, than in the triathletes. So here are guys who, who ostensibly carry no risk factors, or very few risk factors, and it's, just, it's really just surprising. But I think one has to keep it in context and uh, realize that the events are still relatively infrequent. Mm. And I'm not sure how many deaths we've had in triathlons in South Africa, but, uh, you know, it's still a relatively small number. And, and then again, you know, those, these guys have trained a lot, so if it was an incredibly high risk, they would, it should have happened during training as well. So I think the, the message has to be, that, that people should look after themselves and if they ever have any doubts about their fitness or their health, for goodness sake, you know, do go and see a doctor, a specialist who, who can advise you about whether you should be exercising or not. In the studies we did in marathon runners uh, in the 70s and 80s, mm-hmm. remarkably a lot of them had lots of symptoms and they, they developed heart problems during these races which were foretold. They, something was up, and they, they ignored it. I'm not for one moment suggesting that these two guys had any symptoms, but, but the point is that for, the, for everyone, 
you know, when you take your part in these events, just make sure you're completely healthy and you have no symptoms and you don't have flu and you've not had a recent illness so that when you go into the race, you're as healthy as you possibly can be. Yeah, yeah it, it, I mean, it seems like the logical thing to do would be to go and just get checked out anyway because I'm sure these guys thought that they were absolutely fine. Yeah, that, that's the reality. And, and the problem is that even if we do screen them, we, we, we are very improbable that we'll pick up the few who are at really high risk. That, that's the sadness. The trouble with screening is that you also identify a population of people who are absolutely healthy but look potentially unhealthy. And once you start, then you change their careers and you tell them you can't run or you can't cycle, you can't swim. And it's not really very helpful for them because they're actually at no risk. So that is the problem, that you may well detect one or two people and help save their lives, but you may also put 100 people off sport. So it's, yeah. it's very, very difficult because we just, there's no single test that will tell you you are absolutely safe for you to do a triathlon. Just out of sheer curiosity, do you think it could be have anything to do with, with, with the change in, in temperature? You're coming from a run or, or, or a cycle and and all of a sudden you if you're not wearing a wetsuit, you jump into this cold water and, and, and it's sort of a shock to your body. Do you think it could have anything to do with that? Yeah, just, just to make the point, of course, that the swim is the first part oh, of the, the swim, swim is, okay. Okay. All right. So that they're actually starting from a cold start. Okay. And a couple of guys wrote to me and said that uh, one of the problems is you stand around in the wetsuit and you actually get quite hot in a wetsuit um, because you can't sweat through it. And so that's, that's a, a, a potential issue. If you put your wetsuit on an hour before, you might be uncomfortably hot. But, uh, you know, again, I'd, it, again, but the, the, it may be the exposure of the face to the cold water. We don't know. These guys might have had, uh, they might have inhaled water and that may have caused, may have caused them to to panic and you can drown very quickly under those circumstances so the assumption is that they didn't drown i would assume but but it's always a possibility uh professor one one thing i mean you know the build-up to something like the iron man or these big events is months and months of planning and training do you th i mean it's hypothetical but are there, are there sometimes too much pressure put on themselves that they really have to do it and perhaps they had a cold or a flu a couple of days before or a week before, but they, they feel that, that it's necessary for them to go and compete in this uh, sporting activity, which most probably is not the best advice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I was at a talk last night and, you know, the, the athlete, the doctor says, you know, okay, that means you've had flu, you can't exercise for two weeks. And the patient says, does that mean I can start running again tomorrow morning, doctor? Mm, you know, they mm, just don't mm. hear it. You're absolutely right. And we really do think that there are certain viruses that can affect the heart muscle and could put you at increased risk yeah. of sudden death during exercise. So, yes, of course, people train for months and they're not going to stop easily. Yeah. But that's why it's important that that message get out, that mm. you really, if you're going to take these events, and if you are sick, there's always next year. And rather be healthy and not have a heart problem as a consequence of participating when you had a viral infection. But you know, Tim, you make such an interesting point because with comrades, we always say there's only one you, there's loads of comrades. But when somebody's actually, for example, like an Argus, you're going down, you're paying a fortune for your flight, you've paid for your entry, your car hire, your accommodation, all that kind of thing. When someone gets sick, very often that is all cast out of their mind. They're just thinking of the money that they've paid. Yeah, you know, no, John, you, you raise a point because my colleagues, Professor Schwellness and, and Derman, have been collecting data on the people coming to run the Two Oceans Marathon. And it's remarkable that there are some really sick people running the races. I mean, it's not Jeez. that everyone is healthy. There's, there's maybe 100 or 200 people who've had heart attacks, who've got high blood pressure, or have got other problems. So it's not a uniquely healthy population, which we tend to think, that if you can run the two oceans, you know, obviously you must be very healthy. It's not the case. We've got a lot of people out there who've got established medical conditions. And we're certainly not saying they mustn't exercise, but the point being that it's not a, an absolutely healthy population participating in endurance events in South Africa. Yeah, I, th I think uh, all of the points uh, need to be well heeded by those who are in, uh, in exercise. Um, Professor, I, I know you're very busy. Oh, I think John's got a got a good question. Just, just, just finally, uh, Sasha, just wanted to and, and uh, Prof just ask you about Lance Armstrong very quickly. 
what did you? What's your take on it? Well, I think my position is very clear that you have to answer the question: Is Lance Armstrong a normal person or is he not? <laughs> and I, I thought that that interview showed that he has lack of remorse yes. and he's got lack of conscience, and he was doing it for reasons other than to expose the doping that he had done. And I, you know, I, people get angry with me when I start using names, but I want to make the point that in the interview, Oprah Winfrey said to him very pointedly, she said to the effect, are you addressing your narcissistic sociopath sociopathy? Mm -hmm. she, she specifically said that. And it's my opinion that he has a major, major personality disorder that prevents him from seeing what he's done as being wrong. And that's why he will never say he did anything wrong because he doesn't perceive that he did anything wrong. Yeah, you speak to Paddy Upton and he'll tell you he's a psychopath. No, I think yeah, he is, exactly. yeah. Exactly. No, exactly. And I mean, I don't want to use those words because <laughs> I, I used them once in relation to another person in South Africa, a very famous person, <laughs> and I nailed for it. And in fact, Paddy, in his article, really discusses that, that I opened his eyes to this issue of psychopathy. But I, but I think people need to relook at that interview Oh, yeah. And see, is this guy, is he a normal person or not? And, and that's the most important message coming out of that interview. And it was utterly scripted, and he was only saying what he'd been scripted to say. That is my view. Yes. Well, Prof, listen, uh, hopefully next time you're in Johannesburg, you can come spend a whole afternoon with us wow, in the, in the ball nice. studio, because I think we could pick your brain for hours. Well, I'd love to, uh, both of you. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. There we go. Our Professor profits. Tim Noakes, um, I think with unbelievably valuable information uh, regarding training and whether or not you should or shouldn't do um, these kind of endurance uh, things. All right. This is Ball's Visual Radio. Darren, Simon, Kate and John. Weekdays from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Central African time. Balls.co.za.